Well, good morning, church. How are you today? Man, I hope you're excited to be here. I am absolutely fired up. I think it's the time of the year. I really do. I mean, the beginning of a year, I just get psyched. I get excited. Uh, I get all hopeful that, man, this year is going to be different than last year, and we're going to have some things happen this year that, that didn't happen last year. Anybody else get excited about a, a new start, a fresh year? Anyone else out there? Come on, let's hear it if you're excited. Come on, let's hear it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a good time. It's a good time. Hey, if you're a first-time guest with us here today, my name is Danny. I'm the lead pastor, and normally I'm the person that gives the talk, but uh, sometimes I'm not. Last week I was in New York visiting my mom and dad, my brothers. I have two older brothers. They both have a family. They both have three children, so there's nine grandchildren, including our three, and so we had a great time in New York visiting them. I wasn't here with you physically, but I was here in spirit because we watched the online experience in our pajamas, in the house, in New York. It's freezing cold outside. I know you guys got some snow here, and we were with you, dialed in. Loved Matt's talk on God's faithfulness. My favorite thing he said in the whole talk was that God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. Amen? That exciting? And so let's give it up for our online team and the talk Matt gave. Thank you guys so much. Also want to welcome everyone who's dialing in right now live online. Literally, we have some people watching in Saudi Arabia. That's amazing. All across the country, all across the world. Can we give it up for our online audience, guys? Thanks for dialing in. <clears throat> By the way, just a little bit of coaching on the whole online experience. We did not put that out there for people who are like living local and just kind of want to stay home and drink hot coffee chocolate and stay in their PJs. Oh, let's just stay home. Like, I understand if you're sick or you're out of town, like that's cool. But uh, if you're within driving range, we would love for you to be part of an actual campus, you know, like Greenwood, Banto, or Franklin. So just a little coaching there. Is that cool? All right. I won't get on that soapbox. But, uh, so, but we are excited if you're watching today online as well. We don't want you to turn us off, you know. Okay, so hi. Here we are. Um, yeah, so Breakthrough, we're talking about a series, we're actually starting a series today called Breakthrough, and, and then what we're going to do is kind of leverage the natural energy, the natural excitement around this time of the year, new beginnings, a fresh start, and uh, so I titled this series called Breakthrough, and, and you might be thinking, well, what, what is a, a real breakthrough? And in your notes, hopefully you grabbed a, a handout and you're going to take some notes today and you have a pen in front of you there. A breakthrough is about experiencing a new quality of life. That's all it is. It's, it's about busting through to a new quality of living, a new way of being. A breakthrough is about busting through things that have been holding you back, something that's been holding you back in 2017. Maybe it's about getting away from that friend or that person or that boyfriend or that girlfriend that's been holding you back. I have to be careful not to say spouse because I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that you go for a divorce, but, but you got to work through that. But sometimes it's a person in our lives that's just kind of holding us back from getting to the next level. Do you agree? yes or no, right? Sometimes it's your friends, right? Some, some of you have to fire some of your friends if you want to bust through. A breakthrough is about pushing through things like fear, things like worry, things like self-doubt. A breakthrough is about pushing through bad habits. Anybody have the bad habit of procrastination or am I, am I the only one? Yeah, like it's about busting through some bad habits of disorganization and, and, and having the wrong priorities. And a, a breakthrough is about just getting to that next level of living, that new quality. Jesus would call it abundant life or, or eternal life. That's what a breakthrough really is. I believe every single one of us are in need of a breakthrough. I'm, I get so excited about this stuff. Man, I, I could just, I wish all year long was just like January, you know. Not the fact that, you know, we're all a little bit overweight and pasty because the sun doesn't come out. Not, not that. I don't get excited about that. But I get excited about the opportunity, the hope that comes from new beginnings. I was at, like I mentioned, Jackie and I, we took the kids to New York. And on New Year's Eve, we did this big family gathering. And and there was probably, I don't know, 20 of us in the house and nine, nine grandkids all under the age of 16 and under. And, and at one point, we we're all eating dinner and I just, I couldn't help myself. I'm just sitting here looking at all these people like, if we're going to have a better year in 2018, we need to go around the table and talk about what's going to change. And so right there at this family gathering, I said, hey, let's just start one by one talking about like, what do you want to change in 2018? And, and everybody kind of first looked at me like, Really? This is a family gathering. We have pie. There's cookies. 
there's rice, you know, rice cakes, or not rice cakes, rice crispy cakes or whatever they're called. <laughs> brownies, you know, now's not the time to talk about, you know, losing 30 pounds or, you know, what you're going to change, but I couldn't help it. I was like, this is it. This is exciting. And so they kind of resisted me. My family resisted me. My two older brothers, my dad, you know, it's kind of, I'm the youngest, you know, the younger brother doesn't get to say much, you know, because he doesn't know much, but I pushed back. I pushed back. I said, no, let's do it. And so we went around the table one by one, and every person talked about what they wanted to change. Some people talked about getting in shape. Some people talked about, you know, being more present with their family, being more present with the people in front of them. That was excellent. Other people talked about getting organized. They've left some stuff at home that this just totally disorganized. they got to get. It was an excellent conversation about what needed to change. I'm telling you what, if you would do a little bit of thinking, you probably already have, you would come to the conclusion that you need a breakthrough in some area of your life. Maybe it's in your physical fitness. You know you've, you've neglected your diet. You don't exercise. You don't feel well. Maybe it's an, it has something to do with your past, some mistakes that you've made in the past. Maybe you got in trouble with the law. Maybe you had a bankruptcy or a divorce or something happened. And, and that past, the, the, the shame and the guilt ha- has its claws in you and you cannot move forward and you need a breakthrough because of your past. Maybe it's an area of finances, and you know you should be on the budget, and you know you should be saving for retirement, and you know you don't have any extra at the end of the month, and you know the tension in your relationships are, 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 is high because of, because of financial stress, and you need a financial breakthrough. Maybe it's in the area of relationships, and you just have a relationship right now where there's tension, and there's anger, and there's bitterness, and there's a lack of forgiveness. You need a breakthrough in a relationship. Maybe, maybe it's in the area of your job. You hate your job. Maybe you just cannot stand going there. You don't get along with the people. You don't make enough money. Something's got to change in the area of your work. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you make plenty of money, but it's not your passion. It's not your skill. And you know you need to go do something else, but fear is holding you back. I don't know. But something has to change in the area of your work. Maybe it's in the area of your relationship with God. You know you need to be stronger in your faith. You know you need to be praying more. You know you need to be in the word of God more. And you, you know you're not where you used to be a couple of years ago. And you're not in a small group. And you're not taking it seriously. You're not surrendering your life to him like you know you should. And you need an area. You need a breakthrough in the area of your spiritual life. I don't know. Maybe it's in the, your attitude. Maybe your attitude was just in the tank in 2017. And you're just angry with everybody. Just, just kind of short-tempered. Just snarky with people. <laughs> Coworkers. Your family members. Maybe you need an attitude adjustment. Anybody? (laughs) Are you lying to yourself right now? (laughs) I don't know where you need a breakthrough, but here's what I can tell you. I know you need one. So right now, this is what I like to do. I like to make you uncomfortable. Sometimes I got to get you uncomfortable. I'm going to pause for 15 seconds. I'm going to use my new Apple watch here. Some of you know I got it for Christmas. My lovely wife. Thank you, honey. I got a little timer on it. I'm going to shut up for 15 seconds. I want you to grab a pen right now. Go ahead and grab a pen. Come on, come on. Unfold those arms. Come on, I know you're watching with your PJs on, some of you at home. Grab a pen, 15 seconds. Where do you need a breakthrough in your life? Write it down, write it down. Look, I left a space for you. Ready, 15 seconds, 15 seconds. You gotta write it down, ready, go. Ten seconds. Five seconds. Five seconds. Okay, stop. Hopefully you wrote something down because here, here, this series is not going to help you if you don't get clarity on the area that you need to have a breakthrough. Finances, parenting, something in your emotional life, anger, fear, worry. You must be clear in the area that you want to have a breakthrough if you're going to have a breakthrough. Now, I know some of you, because I just watched you, you you just sat there. You didn't write anything down. Your arms stayed crossed. You thought, I've heard all this before. Some preacher gets up there January 7th, 8th, talks about new beginnings, New Year's resolutions. But you're smarter than I am because you know that 80% of the New Year's resolutions come February have totally failed. And you've been in that 80% before, so you don't write stuff down anymore. You're not going to lose the weight. You're not going to get a new job. You're not going to get rid of that relationship that's dragging you down. Because you've tried it all before, and you're a skeptic, and you just know better, so you're just going to sit there. Can I just tell you something real quick? 
That's really negative. <laughs> okay, so it's, I don't know if you've heard, but it's not really good to live a negative life. Like, be a little bit more positive and optimistic. That's, but that's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> what I wanted to say is, if you fall into that camp of skeptical and you're not going to write something down and you've tried all this before, can I just, I just want to let you know, in this series, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about four key principles to having a breakthrough. That if, if, and that's a big if, if you should hear them, receive them, and work them into your life, I promise you, you will see a breakthrough in that area of your life. You say, how could you promise that? Because that's the way God has created us. He's created us to hear things and apply things to experience transformation. That's the way God created me, and that's the way he's created you. That's how change takes place. Oh, and by the way, millions of other people have experienced breakthroughs because of these four principles. So just add that in there. So hopefully you get off your skeptical little platform there, there and, and write something down and work these four principles into your life. Today we're going to cover the first one. Number one, a breakthrough requires complete disgust. Complete disgust. Thorough disgust in your life. You say, what do you mean? I'm going to go to a story in the Bible to, that, that, that shows this principle perfectly. It's the story of Nehemiah. Let me give you a little background. I don't want to bore you. Really quick, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, God was warning his people Israel to stop worshiping idols, to obey him and love him. Sometimes they'd do it, and then they'd go back to worshiping false idols, and, and it's back and forth. Finally, God says, enough is enough. He sends this group called the Babylonians in to take over Jerusalem. They burn down the temple, they break down the walls, they destroy the entire city, and they kidnap every last one of the Israelites except for the poorest of the poor. And in, in, in biblical history, it's called the 70 years of captivity. They take, the Babylonians take the Israelites out of their land and destroy their city. Seventy years later, the Babylonians have been conquered by this other group of people called Media Persia. King Xerxes miraculously writes this decree that says that the Israelites are allowed to go back to Jerusalem. We don't know how it happened. It was a God thing. God told them to do it. And so, sure enough, this guy named Zerubbabel, there's a really awesome name for your next son if you're having children, Zerubbabel, it's in the Bible, Okay, Matthew, Mark, I mean, that's, they had those names have nothing compared to Zerubbabel. Say that five times. Zerubbabel takes 50,000 Jews back to Jerusalem. They start to rebuild the city. They start to rebuild everything, the temple, all that stuff. 80 years after that, if you're a Bible reader, the book of Ezra, Ezra takes another group of, uh, of Jews back to Jerusalem, and he's a, he's a, a teacher of the law, and he's a, a scholar, and so he starts to bring all these reformations to get the people to start obeying God, and that's a great time in Israel. 13 years after that, 444 BC is when we come upon the, the letter of Nehemiah, okay? So Zerubbabel happened, uh, Ezra happened, now Nehemiah, 13 years later. Watch what happens in Nehemiah chapter 1. A group of Jews come from Jerusalem, okay, and they're reporting back to Nehemiah what they saw. They said to me, this is Nehemiah writing, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and, say it with me, disgrace. It's an interesting word. It's an important word. The word is reproach. The word means embarrassment. The word means shame. Okay, you with me? You familiar with those feelings and emotions? That's what Nehemiah felt. That's what they felt. Watch why. Why were they, why were they in this, this, this feeling or this emotion of disgrace? The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Now watch Watch Nehemiah's response to this news. One of those people is his brother, okay? So this is like family talking to family here. Verse 4, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. Now, I don't know when the last time was that you've wept. I'm not talking about crying. I'm talking about that emotion, that, uh, that strange sounds come out of you that you didn't know were inside of you. When you're so broken inside that the only English word that could describe it is wailing. You ever hear somebody wail uncontrollably? <laughs> Nehemiah is absolutely crushed that he weeps. In fact, Nehemiah says, I mourned and I fasted. We're going to do a fast during this series. I'll talk more about that at the end of the talk here. And I prayed to the God of heaven. What happened? Why is... Why is Nehemiah in such a, an emotional, why is he so distraught? 
Well, as, if, as we look into chapter 2, Nehemiah miraculously is able to get out of his job. By the way, he was the cupbearer to King Xerxes, okay? He basically drank the wine and gave it to the king to make sure that there's no poison in the wine. So pretty cool job, unless there's poison in the wine, you know? Then you die. So, so he he's manages to get away from the king to go, to go back to Jerusalem to fix this problem of disgrace. Listen to what he says in chapter 2 when he finally gets to Jerusalem. Then I said to them, the, talking to the officials in Jerusalem, you see the trouble that we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Listen to what he says. Watch this. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. We will no longer be suffering derision. We will no longer be a reproach to the other nations. We will no longer be embarrassed. See, here's the deal with Jerusalem. It was a city. It was a people chosen by God to be a light to the nations. They were supposed to show the rest of the world what it looked like to live life under the rule of God. And because of their disobedience and their idolatry and their worship of false gods, God said, you know what? I'm going to give you over to the Babylonians, and their city was destroyed. And they were doing the exact opposite of what God had called them to do. It goes all the way back to the calling of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. God said, I'm going to call you out, Abraham. You're going to be the father of many nations, and you will be a blessing to the world. And they were nothing, they were everything but a blessing to the world. It was a disgrace. See, it was the embarrassment. It was the shame that caused Nehemiah to weep. And you know what he said to himself? Enough is enough. I cannot live this way anymore when Jerusalem is in the condition that it's in. I must go rebuild the what? The walls. And in 52 days after he shows up in Jerusalem, miraculously, in 52 days they build the entire wall around the city. You talk about a breakthrough. See, the only time we experience a breakthrough in our life is when we get to the point where we're utterly and completely disgusted with current reality. Listen to what Thomas Edison said. Discontent, I would use the word disgust, is the first necessity to progress. I can't take it anymore, not one more day, not one more minute. I must change this current situation. I've had it, enough is enough. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been there? That's where you have to be if you want a breakthrough in your life. Jim Rohn is he's a, he's a guy that is a, it was one of the founding fathers of the personal development movement. He was the Tony Robbins before the Tony Robbins, not the guy from ESPN, okay? He tells this story. You can Google it when you get home on YouTube. It's on there. It's called the Girl Scout story. He says one day he's at home. He's 25 years old. He hears a knock on the door. He goes to the door. There's a little girl there selling Girl Scout cookies. He wants to buy some. She gives this little sales pitch. He reaches in his pocket. He's got no money. He's 25 years old, he's been working since he's 19, he's got a wife, he's got some children, he doesn't have $2 in his pocket. So what does he do? He resorts to lying. He looks at the little girl and he says, you don't understand, like last week another little girl came here and she had a bunch of cookies and we bought all of hers and we're all stocked up. She says, okay, Mr. Roan or Mr., you know, I don't think she knew his name. Closes the door, she walks away, Jim walks back in the house, he says, what have I done? 25 years old. I don't have $2 in my pocket, and I've lied to a Girl Scout. How low do you have to go <laughs> to lie to a Girl Scout? And, he, and this utter emotion of disgust came over him, and that was the day his life changed. He said from that point on, he started to study success. He started to buy books. He got himself a mentor, and about five or six years later, Jim Rohn, the guy who didn't have two in his pocket to buy Girl Scout cookies was a multimillionaire. And he went on to make tens of millions of dollars as he traveled the world teaching personal development. Unbelievable. How did that happen? How does that happen? It happens when a person says, enough is enough, not one more day, not one more minute. I cannot live this way. The walls must be rebuilt right now. Wow, that's powerful. A breakthrough starts with disgust. Now, I know there's some of you here, you're arguing with me in your head, not out loud. You say, how did you know that? Because I do it too, and I listen to a preacher. Yeah, but, yeah, you know what? You you have to say that. You're the preacher, blah, 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 you know. But do you really need to be disgusted? Aren't you being dramatic? Can't you change your life without being disgusted? No, you can't. You've got to be utterly disgusted. Why? In your notes, watch this. A breakthrough requires energy, focus, and determination because there will always be, say it with me, opposition. Opposition. Every time, I don't know if you've noticed this, but every time I've tried to, every time you've tried to make progress in your life, I don't know, maybe you've tried to get on a budget, maybe you tried to get on a diet, maybe you tried to start reading the Bible, 
Maybe you tried to get in a small group. Every time you tried to fix the marriage, fix the relationship, every single time we try to make progress in our life, there's always opposition. It's unbelievable. Nothing comes easy. Have you noticed this, yes or no? And the opposition comes from two places, internal opposition and external opposition. The internal opposition is all the self-doubt. Yeah, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can start the business. Who am I to make six figures? I don't know. I can't write the book. I don't know. And all this self-doubt and fear, that's the internal opposition. Have you felt it? Yes or no? Like, who am I to be successful? Who am I to become a person who's influential, right? You start to doubt yourself. Then there's the external opposition, you know, where maybe you, you start to try to get on this right track or, or you start to get on the budget or you start to change your life and then all of a sudden, you know, the job lets you go or there's some sort of tragedy or somebody gets wounded or hurt or gets sick and has to go to the hospital. It's like, man, I was doing so good. And then this thing happened and it threw me off course. Ever been there? Internal opposition, external opposition. It's never easy to have a breakthrough. And that's why you need energy, focus, and determination. It happened with Sandbow, and he goes in, he, I'm sorry, it happens with Nehemiah, he goes in, he says, guys, I've got this plan, we're going to rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Watch what happens in chapter 2. As soon as he tells everybody his plan, watch what happens. But when Sandbow, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, three dudes who overheard what Nehemiah was saying about the plan to rebuild the walls, they scoffed contemptuously at him. And they said out loud, watch this, what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked they tried to throw the whole thing into confusion. And if you've ever read the book of Maya, which I hope you do because it's a great book on leadership and how to have breakthroughs and vision casting and all that great stuff, it's a fantastic leadership book. You'll see that they don't just stop in chapter two, in chapter three, in chapter four, in chapter five. These three guys and many others try to stop Nehemiah with everything they got, lies, trickery, threats. They try to get an army together to stop, literally physically stop the people from working on the wall. Throughout the entire book, there's opposition. There's opposition, and it's no different in your life and in my life. So why, where are we going to find the energy? Where are we going to find the determination? Where are we going to fi fi find the focus to, to overcome this opposition? I'm going to tell you one place. Complete disgust. This is the way I wrote it in your notes. Disgust provides and sustains the energy necessary to jump over the, the obstacles and have the breakthrough. Does that make sense? William James said it this way. I love it. He said, if you... If you only care enough for a result, you will most certainly attain it. I've been reading that quote for many, many years. And then I'm looking at my life. Why don't I have that, this certain result? And you know what it goes back to? I don't care deeply enough yet. And as soon as I care deeply enough, as soon as I come, become completely disgusted with current reality, that's when I will get the result, and that's when you will get the result. See, disgust it creates and sustains the necessary energy and focus for us to jump the opposition that comes against us when we're going for a breakthrough. I love the way Henry Cloud said it. He said this, when change, we change our behavior, when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Have you heard that before? See, in our current situation, there's pain. Maybe you, 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 you don't feel well, you're out of shape physically. Maybe emotionally you've got some, some cancerous emotions going on inside, like bitterness or rage or anger, and, and there's pain in your current reality. Maybe it's a relationship of some sort, and there's resentment going on, right? But there's also pain in changing. That's why you haven't changed. Because you know it's going to take some effort, it's going to take some work, it's going to take some exertion, there's going to be opposition, and so you haven't changed yet. But, but Cloud says this, he says, when the pain of, of staying the same becomes larger than the pain of changing, that's when we move, right? It's, it's that guy, it's that girl that's been smoking cigarettes for, for 25 years, nothing's happened, and then all of a sudden they get emphysema or they have a stroke, and then what happens? Suddenly, they quit smoking. What happened? The pain of staying the same exceeded the pain of changing. You with me, yes or no? This is how we transform. This is how we have a breakthrough. We have to feel the pain of our current reality. Here's what I'm saying. If you are just slightly agitated, if you are mildly bothered by current reality, 2018 will be no different than 2017. I promise you, please mark my words, if you are slightly bothered 
or mildly agitated by current reality, you will not have a breakthrough this year. It'll be a repeat of 2017. Do you agree? Yes or no? You have got to come to this point where it's like not another day, not another minute, not I'm enough is enough. I've had it. I will no longer live like this. I, I promise you this is how we have a breakthrough. Now, at this point in the service, I've imagined in my mind, and maybe it's not true, that you all are sitting there thinking, okay, uncle, uncle, you're so right. <laughs> that may be not true, but that's the way I imagined it. I've also imagined in my head that you're asking this question, if it takes disgust to have a breakthrough, like, how do I get disgusted? Isn't that, isn't that the question you were asking? Right? No? Yes? <laughs> Humor me. Yes? All right, that's awesome. <laughs> you're alive. I know everybody online was asking that question, right? Okay, if it takes disgust, then how do I get disgusted? Three ideas real quick, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Number one, you got to get honest. I've got to get honest. We got to stop living in denial. So many people are looking the other way. It's not that bad. So many people are comparing themselves. Well, our marriage isn't as bad as their marriage. You know, it's okay. Hogwash. It's horrible. It's terrible. You guys don't like each other, right? Like, like be honest about the current situation. You're fat. You know what I'm saying? I can't believe I just said that. I'm going to get so many emails. Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm sweating. <laughs> let's, try to, let's try to come back. Come back to me. Come back to me. We have to get honest. We have to get honest about current reality. A couple years ago, on a serious note, I watched a movie called Amazing Grace. It's the story of William Wilberforce, the, 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 the English guy, British guy, who, who worked through uh, the British Parliament to end slavery, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade. Fascinating movie. I'm not sure if this is 100% true, but at some point in the movie, what William Wallace, uh, William Wallace, <laughs> William Wilberforce, what he does is because he's struggling and people, people they, they, they don't want to end it. It's amazing. He, they they want to be okay with the slave trade, right? So what he does is he comes up with this idea. He's going to march members of parliament and the members of high society of Britain down to the docks where the, where the boats were coming in. And what they would do, his history tells us, is they, would, they would cram 350 to 600 African slaves on one boat. And then that would be a, a trip of two, from anywhere from two to four months on those boats. History tells us that between 1.5 and 2.2 million African slaves died on the boats. Not after they got here, but on the boats. So he marched them down to the dock, and when the boats would arrive, the stench of the dead bodies, about half of the slaves had died on the way over, would, would hit the members of English parliament, and they got a dose of reality. And that is when the tide turned. And he was able to lead them to abolish the slave trade. What happened? They got honest about current reality. They stopped living in denial and sticking their head in the sand. Oh, it's not that bad. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's not the greatest thing, but, but it's okay. It's the way the world works. No, they got honest about the situation. Number two, you have to play the movie out. Play the end of the movie. What does this mean? Here, I learned this from Henry Cloud. He, he, in his book, Nine Things You Simply Must Do, fantastic book if you want a, a, a challenging book for 2018. Nine Things You Simply Must Do. In the book, he talks about playing the movie. All he, say, all he means is that if, if you continue on the road that you're going right now, doing all the things that you're doing right now, where is it going to lead you 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now? Like if you have all the same habits and they all stay the same, financially, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, your eating habits, your exercise habits, like what, is, what does the story look like 20 years from now? Are you dead? Are you alone? Are you bankrupt? <laughs> Do you have a bunch of awesome people around you or, or, or are you all by yourself? Do you have diabetes? Are you popping 50 pills a day to stay alive? Like, what does the story look like 15 years from now? And if you don't like that story, then change your behavior right now. Like, we're talking about how do you get disgusted? We got to be honest and we got to play the movie out. See, this is what I do all the time. I play the movie out. If I keep on the same course right now that I'm going like into in today's life, where does, what does my story look like in 15 years? And do I like it? Do I feel good? Am I able to give away lots of money to people who need it? Do I have people around me who love me? Do, am I healthy? Am I close to God? Like the only way that story's gonna come true is if I get busy right now and I change my life. Does this make sense? 
play the movie out in your mind. That's how you become disgusted. Let me give you this third one. You gotta get alone with God. I am not giving you a self-help program right now, okay? Some of you may be thinking that, oh, this is no different than Tony Robbins, or this is, no, 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 that's a mistake. That's a mistake. I'm not asking you to come up with ideas to change your life or make your life better. This is a God thing. When Nehemiah heard the condition of, the wall of Jerusalem and the walls were broken down and the city was burning with fire, listen to what he did. In, in, in verse 4, he wept. He fasted. He prayed to the God of heaven. He went to God. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 12, he tells us, he just kind of slips this little verse in there. Listen to what he says. I slipped out during the night. He wanted to see the condition himself of the city, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans that I had come up with. Is that what it says? I'm not asking you to come up with your own plans. Oh, I need to get in shape this year. I need to get on a budget this year. I need to spend more time with the, kid, with the kids this year. I'm not asking you to come up with your own plans. This is what it says about the plans that, say it with me, that God has put in my heart for Jerusalem. Folks, I'm talking to you about what God wants to do in your life. The thing that I'm asking you to get disgusted about, God is already disgusted about it, and he's waiting for you. Let me say that again because it's profound. God is already disgusted with the condition of Jerusalem. He was already disgusted. He looked at it. It was a disgrace. Jerusalem was supposed to be a light to the nations, and it was a reproach. He was waiting for someone. He was waiting for Nehemiah to go, no more. No more. Not another day. Not another minute. Enough is enough. Someone has to rebuild the walls. God was already disgusted. It was his idea. And then when a person became disgusted, when a Nehemiah became, it could have been somebody else, but nobody else was disgusted. I'm here to tell you today that the area I'm asking you to be disgusted about, God is already disgusted about the marriage. He's already disgusted about the disrespect and the negative talk. He's already disgusted about the overspending and the frivolous spending and the fact that you're undisciplined with a budget. He's already disgusted that you can't give away lots of money even though you have extra because you're spending it on yourself. He's already disgusted with those things. He's waiting for you to go, oh, man, enough is enough. I've had it. I want to change. This is a God thing. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to get alone. God, what do you want to change in my life? I know you've been waiting on me, and I want to let you know I'm, I'm in. I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want to treat that person that way anymore. I don't want to feel this way physically anymore. I don't want to have, you know, no money in my pocket anymore because of ridiculous spending. I'm done with it. I'm ready to change. That, folks, that's when we have a breakthrough in our lives. Get alone with God. Play the movie and get honest. Now, I hope that was helpful to you. It's been hugely helpful to me. That's how I changed my life uh, when, I, when I'm looking for a breakthrough. It doesn't always work, but a lot of times it does. Why would we do a fast? Let me, let me share a couple of thoughts about fast and we'll pray and have a song and we'll wrap this thing up. What, what's the deal about fasting? Why did Nehemiah fast? Why did Moses fast? Why did Jesus fast? Like, what's all that about? I tell you, here, we're going to fast for two reasons. Number one, we're going to fast because we need God's help. We cannot, this, again, this is not a self-help program. You can do it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. God, we need you. Like, Nehemiah was asking God for insight and clarity on what to do, and God said, rebuild the walls. When we fast, we get clarity from God. We get strength from God. Yes or no? Okay? It's in the Bible. Okay? That's something about fasting. When we do it, God comes down. Secondly, when you fast, it changes your psychology and it changes your physiology. Basically, what I mean is it changes the way you think about life, you look at things from a different perspective, and it changes the way you feel. And those two things, thinking and feeling, is what produces change in our life. Fasting does that to us. It's just a fact, okay? So we're going to utilize, we're going to leverage the power of fasting to look at things differently and feel differently about our current situation. It might even, fasting might even produce the disgust, the disgust in you that's necessary to have the breakthrough. So what type of fast are we going to present? Well, number one, there's the total fast. This is where you eat nothing 
uh, for 21 days. You eat no food. It's just water and juice. And if you're going to do that, that's the most serious form of fasting. I would definitely check with the doctor and make sure that you're physically able to do that. Then there's the modified fast where you do something like no sugar or just fruits and vegetables. That's mostly referred to as the Daniel fast. That's a very popular fast, okay? You just do plant foods for, for 21 days and liquids on top of that. Then if you don't want to mess with food at all, you're like, no way, dude, I ain't doing that. That's like hyper-spiritual stuff. I understand. I understand. You can do a media fast. Basically, what that means is no television and no movies for 21 days. You'll be surprised how that changes your psychology and your physiology, okay? You'll have withdrawals. Or you can do the social media fast, which is really intense because some of you are addicted to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. I think it would be really, really helpful to do a social media fast. Do you agree? Yes or no? Okay? That will definitely change your psychology and your physiology, okay? You, you start to shake. <laughs> okay, but it's good. It's good because it'll help you. It'll help you have your breakthroughs. So that's a little bit about fasting. Uh, <clears throat> here's how I'd like to end. Myself, we're gonna. My wife and I are still talking about which type of fast we're gonna do. Some variation of the food fast. And but here's the big thing that I'm gonna do. And if you would like to try this with me, it'd be a lot of fun. We could be buddies on Twitter. Um, not if you do the social media fast, <laughs> which I'm not doing. Anyway. <laughs> I am going to fast from coffee. That's right. You heard it. Caffeine. That's how, I know it's 21 days. Listen, listen, little confession time. Confession time. I'm addicted. I am. I'm totally, I'm a, I am a slave to coffee. Okay. And I need to be set free. So you can pray for me to be set free from caffeine. It starts tomorrow morning, not tonight. So I'll be at Starbucks tonight if you want to join me. Um, last cup, last cup. You know what I'm saying? You got to celebrate. And so, is that the way it works? I don't think so, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so Monday morning, Monday morning starts the fast. We'll go from the 8th to the 28th, and then we'll break it on Monday morning, uh, that, that, that following Monday morning. So you can do this. Come on. You guys in? Is this exciting or what? Yeah? Are you fired up? Come on. Like, we only get one life, right? Like, this is it. Like, what life are you waiting for? Like, let's go for this breakthrough, okay? Let me pray for you. Our team's going to come out and close us out with a, with, a, with a song, and then Jake's got some things to share with us. Jesus, we love you. We're here because you have made it possible. You have paved a way for us by dying on the cross and rising again to have eternal life, to have abundant life, to receive grace, to receive mercy. You overcame. You had the ultimate breakthrough. You overcame sin and death by conquering it with your resurrection, by dying on the cross. And Jesus, we're here because of you. Help us. We want to step into a new quality of life. We want to step into abundant life. We want to live the life that you have called us to live. Help us to become thoroughly disgusted with our current reality so that we can have the breakthrough that is on your heart. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name.
Amen, amen. You can have a seat. Now, if you are here tonight and you have never placed your faith in Jesus before, you've never put your trust in Him, I want to talk to you for a second. Maybe there's something in your life that you have felt disgusted about and you just, you've tried everything and nothing seems to work and you're wondering what this thing Danny is talking about, getting alone with God, means. What we just sang about what a powerful name Jesus is. And and one of the things that that name, that his name stands for is change. God is the author of change. And he sees you where where you're at. He might be disgusted with some activities, but he loves you. And he, he doesn't want to leave you alone there. Because see, God, yeah, he died for you so you could have an eternity with him, but he also died so you could live an abundant life now. He, He died so you could have a breakthrough now. See, this is what Jesus did for you. He came down to earth and he lived a perfect life so he could make a sacrifice for our imperfect lives. And he welcomes you to share in that because three days later, he rose from the grave defeating death. And he invites you into that. And he says, all I ask of you is faith in me, that you trust in me, that you put your confidence in me. And there's a lot of ways that we can express faith. And one way is through prayer. So right now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say a prayer out loud. And if this is a decision you wanna make, if you wanna start this relationship, you can just repeat after me in your heart. You can change the words to make them their own. It's between you and God. Let's pray. God, I believe that you sent your son for me. I'm sorry for the times I chose my own way. I recognize that I need a savior. God, I wanna welcome you into my heart. I ask that you help change 
my heart. I believe that your son died and that he rose again. And I put my trust in that today. I love you. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, there is, there's a celebration going on in heaven, the Bible tells us. So let's, let's match a little bit of that celebration now. So here I have a, a, a one-year New Testament. Uh, if you made that decision, I want to give one of these. I want to put one of these in your hand. There's different starting point booths in the back, and they will get you one of these because uh, the Christian journey will be difficult at times. Ask people in this room. It has its ups and downs, but this is, this is our guy. This is God's Word, and it breaks it up into five-minute segments that you can go through each day. So I recommend going over there. And if you have questions about faith, we have our starting point environment, which is a safe place to ask any questions. And I would definitely recommend checking that out.